Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and thanks so much for joining us on episode number 42 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Our guest today has been called the voice of poker. We could stop there and you'd probably know who he is, but his work as the play-by-play man for the World Series of Poker has brought him into the conversation as a possible Poker Hall of Famer alongside his counterpart, Norman Chad. His broadcasting journey to becoming the most well-known voice in poker has taken some amazing twists and turns, and he's here to share some of those great stories with us today. Lon McCarran, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, It's about time you asked me. 42 shows, and I'm I'm here. (laughs) Thanks. Norman's been on, right? I think he's been on episode 20 something. Yeah, you think he's been on. You know he's been on. He's been on, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, little Norman Chad rubbing off on me there. <laughs> it's, well, he did say the same thing. 20 something. What am I? Ch- yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> oh, darn. It's good to see you and speak with you again. Um, well, thankfully, most most of the U.S., the pandemic seems to be lifting. Things are slowly but surely getting back to something approaching normal, what we used to remember as normal. How, let's just start off. How has sort of the last year and a half been for you? And and on a you know more positive note, hopefully, what's it been like to sort of get back a little bit to what life used to be like? Uh, the last year and a half, the only thing changed, I have a lot of uh, downtime now at this point in my career where it had been boiled down to, to poker. Um, there had been times in my career where I was shuffling six or seven different series and traveling uh, quite a bit. Uh, poker did take over several years ago, of course, and there wasn't much time for anything else. So uh, I wasn't able to, to keep up with getting in contact with people and look for, I didn't need to look for work. You know, um, my job as a freelance broadcaster throughout my life has always been, you know, half working and half looking for work. And uh, so poker kind of uh, took over. And so I didn't need to look for work. And then when poker work went away, uh, there wasn't much of any other work to do. So I focused on me and the house and trying to keep in touch with the family and doing projects around here. So it's been quiet, which is kind of normal for half the year. Uh, But summertime, you know, last year we started itching a little bit and wondering what's going on and dealing cards and shuffling your own, rippling your own chips just to get that feel back. Um, Once I got vaccinated, uh, it was kind of like a fog lifting. Mm. Um, And I've not felt like I had a Superman cape on or anything, but I, I felt pretty secure getting out and about. Um, I've got a daughter who works in New Orleans in the restaurant business, so and she caught COVID last year, so mm. I'm very much in tune with what's going on in that um, portion of the world uh, as far as you know who's getting out, what what's open and all, but it has been very nice uh, to get out. Went to the farmer's market this morning and to the regular market and uh it, it is a bit like a weight lifted actually i didn't think the weight was there until it was lifted so right. it's very pleasant oh that's excellent happy to hear it and, and happy things are sort of getting back on track um you know gotta got ask that poker related question like you said looking ahead how excited are you for the uh, wsop this coming fall well i'm really excited actually it's great to to have it back you can feel the buzz um i i go into it uh, this year with a, a, a grain of salt or a pound of salt, you know, I don't know how much international travel is going to be allowed uh, both ways. And, and that would include you um, for the players, for the workers. Uh, you know, I have no problem getting to Las Vegas. I've already been there a couple of times uh, work related. So if I need to, I can drive there and if yeah. I feel safer. It's, it's a day's drive. Um, but I, I'm curious about the numbers. Uh, obviously, the enthusiasm is there. The World Series and Las Vegas uh, seem to be, you know, f- full bore ahead yep. with what's going on. Uh, January or June one, I think, is when Vegas kind of opened up 100%, taking down plexiglass and letting full capacity in the casinos. Um, California is about a week be- or two weeks behind them, uh, where I am. And so uh, there's still going to be some restrictions here in California, but for the World Series of Poker, 
I, I don't know what the numbers are going to be. I know a large portion of the field is international. So, so we'll see. I have friends in Canada who we thought Canada was doing great. Uh, and then Canada, Canada kind of took a, a slide back. And so we'll get a lot of players from Canada. I think it's the number two or Great Britain, number two uh, international, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of number of players. So um, it's going to be great, great to see people um and feel that feel you know walking through and hopefully you know they're going to complete the full schedule and uh just make it one of the sh you know i think well at least we'll get a november 9 again for one thing yeah. <laughs> and then turn around and just do it again you know but what's old is new that's for sure well i yeah. i do hope to be there thankfully as an american citizen and it doesn't matter where i live i'm able to travel back you know i'm in israel but you know we got flights i've already been to america about a month and a half ago uh so thankfully i, I do have yeah. plans to be there uh and uh you know like you said hopefully we'll be joined by by thousands and thousands of others from around the world just like you know that's our cards chat community is from all around the world right um you know it's not going to be summer it's not going to be 110 degrees besides that is there anything specific you're looking forward to from this fall incarnation of the wsop uh you know i'm just curious on on where people uh are going to be uh in their head space and skill space in terms of poker um they uh, really haven't probably had a lot of opportunity to play live unless they've got some home games, but certainly not the same. We do see the tournament circuit uh, warming up, uh, just a big event recently in Houston, and they moved over to, to San Diego, and, and uh, I'm sure Florida is going to be uh, rolling uh, here where I am. I'm near Thunder Valley in Northern California, and they're starting to get things on the schedule um i've got friends at uh, world series of poker circuit and i've visited uh the circuit stop in aruba and i know they're trying to get on the board um i was i had plane tickets and uh, the whole schedule ready to go to morocco last may for a circuit event wow. for a couple of weeks and then that uh unfortunately got canceled so i'm hoping that you know they'll get back on board right uh but it'd be, just be curious to to see how the play is. And, and I and I feel, you know, we're not gonna be able to really come and look at a table and say, oh, these guys are rusty, but they'll right. feel it. So you have to really talk to them and, and figure out how they feel. Um, and the sharp ones uh, who have been doing their own training sites and podcasts, they're probably, you know, a little closer to 100% than, than the rest of us. Sure. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting, but I, um, you know, it, maybe we won't hear the bad beat stories in the bathroom in as many languages, but uh, it's still going to be a great welcome back, I think. Sure. I mean, we often, you know, a lot, lot of us who, who, who go, you know, for, for the last few years, uh, you know, regulars, we call it summer camp. So it's not going to be summer, yeah. but part of that whole idea is seeing people who you haven't seen for so long. And that's just amplified to the nth degree uh, after, you know, this lengthy period of time we've been hunkered down. Are there any uh, particular shout outs or any particular people you're looking forward to seeing again and, and reuniting with? Oh, just our crew. You know, I mean, there's a number of guys from, from overseas that I become friends with, um, but a lot of the regulars in, in our crew. Um, and, you know, as you know, it, it, you never know who's going to be there is one thing. And you hope that your whole crew will be. And, and one of the, the question marks, of course, is Kara Scott and whether or not she'll be able to get out of Italy. I don't believe she's vaccinated yet. They're still working on that. Things have improved a lot in Italy. Uh, it's not only difficult to get out or impossible right now, but uh, expensive also to, to get over here. So, uh, yeah, those those types of folks. Um, you know, you just wonder, you know, who's going to show up? Uh, a lot of Canadian friends uh, that I have, and, and I, they can't really come out here yet. So hopefully in the ensuing months, uh, we are seeing, we're, I, I think it, it was a slow rollout. We had a sprint in the U.S. and where I am, uh, it's like, okay, we've got vaccines now. Who wants it? Right. Uh, so we're in that mode, shipping vaccines out of the country. Uh, so, you know, hopefully that halo effect will help everyone, 
uh, feel more secure and, and allow the travel to, to get them here. So yeah, the international folks, uh, obviously. Amen. I hope so. And uh, of course, you know, you name drop Kara Scott. She was episode number 21 here. Yeah, and, uh, first, I did... always, she's always before me and Norman. Yeah. I know. And yes, and Norman was number 26. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we just checked. Um, so with you know, this one announcement that we do know, uh, kind of a difference from man, all the previous times we've moved to, to CBS Sports. And this is going to be the first time in almost 20 years that the WSOP won't be on ESPN. Do you have any sort of news on how the move will impact you and the broadcast, if at all? Uh, not specifically. I have a very rough schedule um, that uh, it will be mostly our schedule, of course, is gonna have some say so from CBS Sports, but a lot of our work is gonna be dependent on what happens with Poker Go and what events they wanna do live. Um, I've had one conversation with our, our producers on kind of what's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be oh, upwards of almost 20 or so at this point that I know bracelet events that will be live nice. um, and probably more will be live, but I think they've chosen 18 uh, to then be cut down into a two hour version to be shown on CBS Sports. The main event uh, will be, again, mostly live, but it's not guaranteed to be 100% live on Poker right. Go. And then I think another uh, upwards of 18 or so two-hour versions of those live shows to be shown later on, on CBS Sports. Uh, now, the, the main event shows, I think, are going to be a little more edited than they have in the past when they're turned around. Uh, of course, it used to be we would shoot the main event they'd get edited down into two hour, one hour versions and Norman and I would go and announce the whole thing. Right. Uh, they then pulled back from that where we would call it live, uh, it would be on Poker Go. And then uh, they would kind of do editing and try to cut those into one hour chunks. We would have to go into a studio for a much shorter period of time to recreate some moments or just to say, hey, welcome back, or we're going to commercial, those things. I think there's gonna be a little more leaning towards the uh, post-produced shows, which kind of where Norman and I made our name uh, mm -hmm. in the poker world. Uh, the live call is wonderful. I think it has a great audience. I think it's, it serves a purpose, but I think uh, if you're gonna do an edited show, it's nice to have a, a fresh call, it's a different, form of announcing yeah uh it's a little fuller in what information you have um in terms of what happened in terms of who the people are uh in terms of uh, getting ex-wife jokes in and things like that so it's 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 a very different type of broadcasting that we try to make feel live and i think we've succeeded in that through the years uh and i hope we can get back to that if we're going to do post-produced shows but uh, with the live shows, I love working a three-person booth. Jamie Kerstetter has been a great addition. I wouldn't mind seeing Antonio back, uh, you know, here and there, but um, just very rough outline right now is what I've been given. And I think that's probably what they have right now. So there's a lot more thinking to be done. Gotcha. And if you name John, Jamie Kerstetter, we got to say she was episode number three. So yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> All the women get first and Norman and I are like, uh... Uh, you know, who's next? I promise I did not plan this running gag, but it seems to be working. <laughs> it's um, working very well there, Robbie. Very nice. There you go. Good timing. Well, uh, you know, you're referencing all these you know, previous years, numerous changes have been made, you know, to, to keep up with the times and the changing tastes of the audience. Let's go back even further. You've been broadcasting the WSOP since 2002, the Robert yes. Marconi year, not, uh, this is before Moneymaker. So mm -hmm. I, I want to ask specifically about that year. Besides changing partners, broadcasting partners from Gabe Kaplan to Norman Chad, was there a specific way that 2003 felt different than 2002 production wise? Oh, definitely. Um, what happened with 2002, it was similar to uh, some earlier years. There was um, basically a guy uh, in Vegas who had a production company uh -huh. and he had shot uh, in one form or another, like the previous 15 or so main events. 
Um, and he would just take a few cameras down and, and shoot footage, uh, edit it together and, and make a show out of it. Uh, wow. And he did the same thing in 2002, not knowing where it would air. He didn't have a contract that I understand with any one broadcast entity. Wow. Uh, he had, he kind of on spec, kind of on the fly, he would, he, he shot it, um, <laughs> and he had the footage and then, uh, so that was, uh, of course they were a little earlier. So I guess they shot in April or so, April, May of 2002. Um, I was nowhere near it. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, working in a bank. Right. Uh, right. and, uh, so I got a call from an ES, ESPN producer who I didn't know uh, in like January or so of 2003 and said, some guy came to us and he's got footage of the World Series. We're going to put a couple hours on. Uh, do you want to do it? Because I had done a poker show in the last year uh, and going to work with Gabe Kaplan uh, or uh, should I say my good, my good friend, Gabe Kaplan. Uh -huh. And uh, so, uh, yeah, sure, I can do it. I've got some vacation time from the bank. And uh, so we did that show. It was, um, it was different. I'll say, uh, Robbie. There, he wasn't. Uh, the producer wasn't really prepared for us when we came to the voiceover session. He mm. hadn't put the whole card camera in, which was basically a huge monster big TV camera wow. mounted under the poker table next to the dealer. Right. And as the players uh, mucked their cards, he would hold the cards over the camera and then kind of recreate what the cards were with a, either a fake whole cam, I'm not sure if he did that, or just graphics. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and there were parts of the show that, that Gabe and I were looking at a blank screen because he hasn't finished the editing yet. He just kind of said, <laughs> oh, we're talking about this because we're going to do this. So yeah, it was a nightmare. Wow. Um, the next year was when ESPN uh, began their full commitment uh -huh. to the World Series of Poker with a new production company, 441 Productions in New York, Matt Morantz uh, guiding the ship. Brilliant producers, brilliant minds, brilliant documentary uh, stylistic type of uh, cinematography, uh, which, which really added to the whole aura of what the early years of the World Series of Poker was. And so we had huge crews. Um, they had a plan uh, and it, it was very well executed. So going from that early 02 version to the wow. next year, it really was uh, like going from Little League to the Baseball World Series um, as wow. far as production and and how I felt fitting in. And that was, of course, the first year I had met Norman. I had known Norman, but uh, it just felt like a real thing. You know, it really was was uplifting to be able to be in that process. It was a lot of fun. Very cool. I think it's so important for poker fans, you know, whether you're long term poker fans or even you know newer fans who've come into the game in recent years to know, understand, and appreciate the history of how things have evolved, even from the broadcast side. It's not, you know, we take it for granted that everything's available all the time on every network. It did, like you said, it comes from yeah. much, much and, more humble and, roots. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think one thing that gets overlooked, I'm, I'm still friends, and, and he's one of the guys I do look forward to to see every year is, is Robert Varconi uh -huh. um, and his wife, who's a tremendous poker player in her own right and, uh, and anybody's right, actually. Uh, but there was a Varconi effect that nobody really pays attention to. If you look at the numbers and, and the, uh, you know, attendance at the World Series and, and main event, it had its, you know, it wasn't huge. There was at best a few hundred people. Um, and then after we did the O2 show, which aired uh, pretty close to the beginning of the O3 uh, World Series of Poker, uh, suddenly you have over 800 people at, at the main event. And, right. and uh, when Moneymaker won, of course, it tripled the next year. Right. Um, but Var the Varconi year uh, is kind of a forgotten kick in the pants for the poker community. And, and uh, I think people should recall that you know, there were 800 people at the main event in 03. And that was a huge, huge number for those days. For sure. Well, you know, you, you obviously have a, a lengthy perspective uh, and you've been to all of these World Series over the years. We're kind of curious 
uh, you know, maybe we don't love to pick favorites ne necessarily, but we'd like to know your favorites. So we're going to ask, uh, I got five of them here. What's your favorite moment from the World Series over the years? Favorite moment? Wow. Um, the, the, the one that, um, it was fun calling, uh, you know, bracelet winners uh, of, you know, legendary players. Mm. And uh, I got to call, uh, which I, I think was Doyle's, uh, Doyle Brunson's last bracelet win, uh, which was, was really fun. Um, the, uh, gosh, the Joe Caddy year was, was just so, uh, thrilling in so many ways. Mm. Um, uh, the, those two stand out, Greg Merson standing on the, on the stage crying mm. after what he had been through in, in his personal, uh, life that, that might maybe stand out as a number one moment for a lot of reasons there. Very cool. I remember, I still have it ringing in my ears when you called Doyle. Doyle's done it. I remember that. Doyle's that, done it, yeah. Doyle's done it. Very cool. Um, do yeah. you have a favorite year of the WSOP that you've attended? Oh, gosh. The last one I worked is always my favorite, uh -huh. favorite year because that means I'm still working. You know, uh -huh. hopefully 2021 will be my favorite. Um, I... Uh, you know, they do blur together in a way, you sure. know, I mean, if we're just talking World Series, you know, we, there were years when we covered most events, even a lot of the early bracelet events, right. there were years where we only did the main event. Uh, and I couldn't even tell you what, what years they were. I'm, I'm not that kind of, uh, you know, numbers file guy who could uh -huh. say, Hey, then the Oh nine, this is what happened. Sure. Um, but uh, just, you know, the, the times when we got to do a lot of events uh, mm. leading up to the main event, it gave us so much uh, perspective on on the folks who were there who and what they had done earlier. Um, I, I really enjoyed Martin Jacobson and, and what he did. And it was one of the first times where, uh, you know, I was I was a neophyte to poker and had to learn my way through the field and through the broadcast world and the nomenclature and and, and gain the respect of, of people out there. And I worked hard on that. And I just remember uh, Martin Jacobson, um, you know, not having uh, a lot of chips, but I just saw the way he was playing. And I it was kind of, I threw out a, a random prediction that, you know, Martin is going to win this thing. And wow. yeah, I think he had to come from the bottom, come from the bottom of the pack. But so yeah, a little feather in my cap. And that, and that was fun. So uh, to have those moments, they kind of stick out uh, nicely, but the main event is so uh, special. It's a unique event in the poker world. And just to be able to see the numbers of people that come in, it's, it's very gratifying, uh, you know, what we've all accomplished in this world. Brilliant. Well, of course, shout out to Martin Jacobson. He was episode number 23. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're still you going. don't have anybody who's after me yet, right? Who, 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 who are you doing next week? Do you know? <laughs> Stay tuned. Who, who would come after me? Uh, give me a name. <laughs> um, obviously, part of uh, a, a tremendous part of what you and Norman and all of the other you know po people who've guested in the commentary booth and Jamie, it, what you do in that broadcast booth is you help create characters and craft stories, especially in those early years with the post-produced episodes. Do you have a favorite character or story over the years that you helped to build and were a part of? One, one story stands out actually from year number one that we did mm -hmm. it in 03. Um, and it there, there had been a lot of talk through the years on whether or not we were doing it live or not. And again, we never, pretended that we were calling it live. We never uh, tried to actively mislead people. We, we tried to always announce in the moment though. Right. And so, uh, and the WPT has always done that and they continue to do that. And they have certain tricks they do production wise um, to do that. So um, we, we try not to make it a highlight show. Mm -hmm. So we, and and we've succeeded but one thing that really helped was sam grizzle sitting at our feature table in the early years and norman and i were close 
We were very close. We were behind a curtain. That's how close we were, just okay. a few feet away from the feature table. And uh, they actually could hear us. And we weren't <laughs> announcing, we were just talking. Uh, but Sam said something and we both, Norm and I laughed out loud and Sam heard our laugh. And so he reacted to our laugh. And so when we went into post-production, we recreated our laugh so then he could, he could hear. So everybody thought, oh, they're doing it live. And uh, you know what? A, what a nice thing that you're. So it was, it it wasn't. It was a little deception, I guess, but it it created a nice moment that um, boosted our production plan Excellent. at least. Uh, so I mean, and and there are, there are cards that come out that you you know you just go crazy about sure. you know and and happened you know Joan Cattage year and early ones. So I remember there was a a mixed game. Um, this just a terrible run out for someone which is always a great run out for someone else but right. um again you know maybe they'll be in my book someday but uh -huh. i can't uh -huh. like pick out the year or anything like that sure. it just always count on something crazy to happen that's what's fun and i look forward to that and the earthquakes provided that moment a couple of years ago ah too. the earthquakes the legendary yes of course yeah um, well, obviously, like the, the legendary broadcasters of the world, the Chick Hearns, the Vin Scullys, you know, the Bob Costases, they have those legendary calls that you hear every so often on those highlight packages. Do you have sort of like a, a call that you made on a particular play or hand that you remember as being like a signature moment of yours? Uh, no, actually, I don't. Uh, mm. I, I do. I do try to... Um, in the, in the early years when it was entirely post-produced, I was very conscious of, um, you know, kind of where this announce and this call uh, might end up or how it would be used. And a lot of times people do use the highlights, uh, you know, in their news programs or they're going to be used in a compilation of players winning. So, um I'm, I'm a little over prepared sometimes. And so I, I do try to, you know, make the winning call different year to year if I have that opportunity. Um, and you just never, you never know how it's going to be used. So, sure. uh, you know, there, it just, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Going back to Joe Cata, uh, Norman and I had talked about, you know, things when we, we were, we were on site, those were quick turnarounds with the Joe Caddy year where mm. we didn't have months to do it. it might have been the first year where we had editing on site and we were turning the show around in 24 hours I think wow. um, and so you know Norman's big thing with young kids was you know he's a kid with a dream right and we're able to finally put a button on that you know and he <laughs> said you know he's a kid with a dream come true and so when you have those little nuggets that just kind of work uh, you never know where they're going to come, uh, but it's very gratifying. Uh, but as far as a one call, uh, I don't know. I've had guys have me recreate a nine on the river for some uh -huh. reason uh -huh. on their podcast or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what that meant to them, but it seemed to be, there's a lot of nines on the river, I guess. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if, if not your own, uh, our last favorite question here, do you have a favorite Norman Chad ism? Oh, wow. I'm a big uh, wamboozled guy. Uh -huh. um, I love uh, the wamboozling uh, whenever he can bring it in. Uh, and I think probably that is because there's a funny story when uh, we were doing the shows, we used to go and fly to New York a week at a time and, and work on the, the shows. And um, once the shows are edited and announced and mixed and done whatever they have to do, sure. um, they've got to be sent in time to a company. Uh, at that point, ESPN did the work, but they sent it to another company to type out all the closed captioning oh. um, so <laughs> okay. they, could, they could have it right. So it, it takes a while. Um, so yeah, they need some time on that. And I remember we had, we were in New York, working on a show and we were done and we went to uh, a bar somewhere with a bunch of the crew and it was a Tuesday night and they were showing the World Series show that we had done last week, the previous week. And closed caption was on uh, because most smart people turn off our live announce and just read the, the closed caption. Hmm. So 
uh, and then a bar, you know, you can't convince anyway. So right. we're watching the show, closed caption, and Norman does his line. You know, he needs a nine on the river or he'll be wamboozled. Uh -huh. And then uh, the nine doesn't come. And I said, let the wamboozling, you know, commence. And Norman gives the chuckle and we move on. So, but if you read the closed caption, <laughs> it gets us into so much trouble because <laughs> Norman's making his call. He says he, uh, he needs a nine on the river or he'll be woman boozled. And then I say, <laughs> let the woman boozling begin. <laughs> <The close -down. laughs> Luckily, wow. people took it for what it was worth and we didn't get into any uh, I love trouble. It. But I love so, it. So, yeah, I guess uh, that has a special place in my heart. My Great mind. story. Great <laughs> story. Um, well, Lon, poker fans around the world, of course, they know you primarily from your on-camera work at the WSOP main event, but they don't see the much larger part of the iceberg below the surface. There's a lot of prep work. Like you say, you always come in very prepared uh, that you do behind the scenes, some of which I've personally borne witness to from my past work uh, with the poker. And have helped me with. As well, oh, thank you. Helped me with, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I've seen it, and uh, I'm just curious. What, not any secrets or anything like that, but is there anything that you can share with our audience as far as your personal broadcast prep routine, if you have something like that, just so that they get an idea of what goes into it before the red light goes on in the camera. Um, the the one thing uh, there's just uh, oh, you know so many people. Uh, at, at the main event. And when we did the shows post-produce, you obviously knew who was going to be on the show. Our research department and, and uh, us as well had chance to, to do what we were going to do and, and find out who they are. And, and hopefully they wouldn't lie to us and tell us they were a dolphin trainer or something like that. Sure. Um, later on, uh, you know, I and everyone else had to scramble because we were doing it live. And once we get down to a certain number, it's just, who are these people? And in and, and the early days, even day five, where we pick up the action now, uh, we can have people coming to quickly to our featured table. Uh, we don't know who they are. You know, they throw me a name, maybe, you know, most of the time, sometimes we don't know who they are. So uh, kind of laxed into like, let everybody in on the secret, we're on the fly here and you know we don't know who this person is we'll figure it out and we'll let you know uh when we get down to the final 27 is kind of where i uh really we have to know everybody obviously and we have overnight normally to do that so um it, it's just having um the key information on on everyone and some minor details on each player that i can and I create kind of a book for myself, mm. uh, specifically with the final 27. Um, and just so I can quick refer uh, to what they are, you know, name, hometown, profession, whatever like that. So it's just as much digging as I can do. And then having it in a form where it's easily digestible to me and which then I could uh, spit out to the audience if need be. And it, it's just a matter of you know, spending the time, you know, and 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 having it for you. Um, I remember sitting down uh, with this. Uh, I try to keep it two sheets, so it's always open for me in a physical form, mm -hmm. uh, one through twenty-seven. Um, and just if every white space is filled on, and and then we were switching announcer. Another announcer came in and saw what I had and they said, this is more research than I've done ever in my poker career. Wow. <laughs> you know, what I've done in the last day. So I do pride myself on that and, and trying to be as prepared because I've learned my lesson through the years that if I'm not prepared, uh, it's, it's I'm the only guy on TV at that moment who was not prepared. I've been on the air in local television as a sportscaster, a fill-in sportscaster and thrown it back to the two anchors and forgotten one of the anchors name on live TV. So ah. I vowed never to let that happen <laughs> again or try to be unprepared. So it comes out of uh, fear uh, <laughs> of that moment and fear for my uh, future career that, you know, I've, I've got to be right. I got to be ready. 
uh, or I've got to come up with a good line to fake it. <laughs> right. Well, the results certainly are stellar. Like I said, we're, we're familiar with the on-camera work, and uh, certainly mm -hmm. it's it's phenomenal. Um, just to switch a little bit, though, unfortunately, last year's broadcast kind of had to be different than previous years. Um, so many reasons. Obviously, it was December. There was the online live hybrid. You really were only broadcasting the final table. There was no final 27, so to speak. Um, and to top that off, it was a year where we didn't hear Norman's voice uh, as he was recovering from COVID. For you, from where you were sitting and in your role in the, in the broadcasting, how different did last year feel? And I, you know, with all of these different curveballs thrown your way, what would you say were some of the, the hurdles that you had to overcome and, and, and successfully did? Well, to take it uh, behind, uh, again, the story uh, a little bit behind the curtain, um, Jamie Kerstetter, who I did the shows with, uh, and I had been hired by Gigi Poker, uh, to do um, announcing, they had planned four shows of their own, half hour or show, just to be shown online on their YouTube channel. Uh, and so we did a version, it was much more highlight of the online action leading up to the final nine, both mm -hmm. for the international and the US. Right. Um, and uh, Gigi Poker, uh, kind of made a mistake, unfortunately. Uh, they did a lot of good, but they made a mistake in thinking they could use some of the live footage from the final table uh, before ESPN aired it. And of course they couldn't, uh, just, you know, there was some research problem there. But uh, so Jamie and I did a couple of shows um, leading up to that uh, of just showing the online action and talking it out. And we did it in our own homes. I did it in this room and Jamie did it, in, you know, in Las Vegas. Vegas where she lives. Mm -hmm. So we had some idea of the players involved. Um, again, not a lot because we weren't on site. Um, and then when we got down to uh, the final nine, uh, then everything, of course, was going to switch to ESPN and we had live coverage. We did go to an audio booth uh, in Las Vegas at Poker Go Studios. And so it was, um, yeah, everybody just kind of took it for granted that it wasn't going to be the same. Right. We're going to make the best out of this. Sure. Uh, the players, luckily we had some recognizable players um, and then had to introduce the people to the players that maybe they should recognize for the mm -hmm. future. Some great uh, South American players, of course, sure. um, great online players. So it was different. And so that was in a sense, Robbie, that, that was kind of refreshing uh, for me, uh, it was all new for, for Jamie, but Jamie done a lot of broadcasting herself with us yes. and not with us. Uh, so no stranger to the, to the process. She just had to learn our process uh, mm. of, of working in a booth. She'd never worked in a booth with me in a recorded sense, always the live stuff, uh, which she excels at. And now we know she excels, you know, at working in a booth as well. Right. So it, it kept us, uh, talk for me, it kept me on my toes and again, trying to be prepared, not knowing what Jamie was going to bring and, and what the new process was going to bring. So um, it, it was an old hat. It was all brand new. And so uh, for that, yeah, that was great. Unfortunately, it was just a handful of shows. Right. Um, but you know, that's kind of how the year was, you know, yeah. everybody just kind of said, this is, this is the new normal for now. Right. Uh, let's get by this and hopefully next year uh, we'll be back, you know, with the whole thing. Yep. And I'm pretty sure that uh, that, that whole thing, that whole package that we're used to is something we could expect to see again. Uh, this would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. This coming fall. Uh, Lon, if I told you back in 2003 during Chris Moneymaker's run, that you and Norman would be finalists for the Poker Hall of Fame in 2020, what would you have said? Oh, I'd say, what's the Hall of Fame? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. um, again, uh, it, uh, it, was, it was staggering to me just to be considered. Um, and... Uh, I had no idea that, you know, we, there would be a beyond 2003 at that time. Right. And of course, when we were doing the shows in 03, um, 
it was no year, nowhere near a poker boom. Nobody in the world, uh, the regular world, uh, outside of Binions at that time knew Chris Moneymaker. Um, but when they started showing uh, those final shows over and over and over, we kind of got a feel that, that things were, were going to change. And I was just happy things were changing in my professional life because I had basically given up TV. Uh, and uh, then this kind of, you know, clawed me back, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, again, knowing now what I knew then of poker in terms of my own, um, oh, I don't know, skill recognition of, of what's going on and how to play and what the players are doing, you know, and what it changes through the years. I, no, there was no way that it was like, uh, they must have a... a, a if I heard that, it would be like, how low is the bar set for this World <laughs> Series of, you know, in 2020? But it was a great experience to be nominated. And uh, as Norman has mentioned, you know, yeah, we jumped the line on a lot of people. Uh, there's a huge backlog, uh, mostly international player backlog. So mm -hmm. uh, let's let the players who, you know, kind of built the game in that regard um, have their, their day there's talk of having a different wing of it, you know, with the builder category and all. I think the other sports have that too. And they have announcers in their, you know, hall of fame. And if, if they bring that in, you know, I'll give a speech. Sure. Great. Excellent. Well, I, I certainly hope I support uh, your candidacy, uh, your nomination. Do you have and, a vote? Uh, Do you have a vote? I used to briefly. Oh uh, uh, yeah, okay. they changed it again. Okay. They keep changing. No, it. they took it away from us, didn't they? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I'm Thank sure you. you'll be joining Chris someday in the future in the Hall of Fame. And of course, shout out to Chris, episode number 15 of the Cards Chat 15. podcast. Took you 15 shows to get Chris Moneymaker on. He's a tough guy. Right, I don't feel Mom. so bad. He's a tough guy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be in my town. I'm going to see him pretty soon. He's coming to uh, back to Sacramento area. Pretty oh, soon. Wonderful. It's be nice too. Wonderful. To so send yeah. send uh, warm regards from the cards chat community. From um, number 42. Hello, number 15. Okay. There you go. There you go. Uh, it, it, <laughs> In the, We're going to wear the, little badges now around the world. You know, I was <laughs> we'll number 42. How about you? <laughs> um, you, you obviously, like you said, you know, you had, you had said that you gave up on broadcasting, but I want to go back to that when, you know, you did so much in broadcasting prior to getting into poker. I mean, even today, poker is considered kind of a niche property for a TV network versus like, you know, the NBA or the NFL, but, you know, you could kind of be considered, you know, almost the king of niche sports. You covered yeah, right? bowling, pool, scrabble, the X Games. I mean, you got an Emmy nomination for the X Games. Uh, what was it like for you to be so versatile and, and have you know expertise or much more expertise than the regular person at so many different kinds of niche sports? Um, you know, Necessity is the mother of invention. So mm -hmm. I needed to pay my mortgage. <laughs> uh -huh. So I would, I would be hired for, uh, for anything. And mm -hmm. I never really positioned myself to be uh, one of the, you know, major league baseball guys, NFL guys, you know, I learned early on that those jobs are, you know, so few and far between mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a tough get. I wasn't on that path though i i wanted to be of course any sportscaster you know wants to do that um i learned early on that the most important thing was to work mm -hmm. and to learn the craft and there were a lot of shows uh where it didn't pay well uh you know the hotels were crappy and you know uh, who are these people what is a sport type thing but I think coming from a broadcast family, my brother also a, a, was a broadcaster in news in San Francisco. My dad, likewise, um, and both in, in the South where I was born and in, in California. Uh, and so I had a little insight that this is not something you just jump on the bike and you're perfect at, at riding it. Um, you're always honing your craft, even mm -hmm. after this many years. I'm learning things and learning ways to to do it better and and be more accessible in what I say. Um, and it, uh, you know, it it was 
hard to do those shows. It, I had to do a lot of them because they didn't pay well. Mm. But um, it really was uh, invaluable lessons that I learned, at, both in terms of how shows are done, how to interact with uh, people live on the site venue, and then with the production crew leading up to, you know, voiceover, everything was done. You know, we shoot the show, edit it, and go into a booth and do it. Um, so uh, I, I may have, I don't know, I've never done the numbers, but I did a lot of shows and I was like a voiceover, you know, king, maybe, you know, there was, I just knew how to do it. Uh, right. I knew my role because I worked with a lot of guys who were in the sport that we were announcing mm -hmm. but they weren't into broadcasting right but they were chosen to come into the booth and work for me so i had done a lot of interviewing through the years as a reporter for espn2 when they first started hundreds of features i did for them so i became pretty adept at interviewing people and then in this format it was kind of like an interview format mm -hmm. because that sport expert didn't really know how best to bring out the information they wanted. So I was able to draw information out of them with keys, certain key questions and try to make them look better. Um, and that was always my goal to make them look good, whoever I'm working with, because that made the show look good. And, and Norman and I share that too uh, amongst ourselves, but uh, it was invaluable. And, and to, to do those shows, I look back very fondly, even though it was a grind uh, at that time. Um, and I had, I built up a lot of work. I built up a good rep, you know, repertoire of, of different kinds of sports, odd sure. kinds of sports. And all of that comes into play to this day even. So yep. I, I can't speak badly about it. Excellent. I did a lot of, of, of wisdom in that answer. And I know, dare I say, I don't know what, what you're going to be saying for the, you know, answering the rest of our questions, but, you know, folks, if you're listening, play that part back. There's a lot of very, very important wisdom in what Lon just said, and you actually even answered uh, one of the questions I had uh, prepared. So uh, I'll skip that oh, one. Good. No, really, look, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, brilliant. That's a, I love that response so much, uh, and I'll be listening back to it too. Um, well, it would be befitting, of course, you know, that this interview is mostly covering your broadcasting career, but you also have some poker chops yourself, Lon. Uh, when did you start playing, and do you prefer cash games or tournaments? Uh, a, I prefer tournaments. Okay. Uh, I like the... Uh, I'm, I'm Scottish, so I've got a cheap streak in me. So I'm happy to make one buy-in and try to stay for hours, uh -huh, which uh -huh. is a huge, by the way, I've learned. Um, uh, and with, of course, with rebuy tournaments, that changed all that. But mm -hmm. uh, I just started playing with the crew, the early crew, oh. uh, and they were uh, all non-poker players, pretty much themselves. The the key guys in our first production group. Um, were documentary producers, as I previously mentioned. Uh, so they had to learn the game. Uh, and I remember, oh gosh, we would uh, play during breaks uh, at, you know, at the Rio. Nice. And one main producer, he would go jump at a cash game and he'd come back and say, oh my gosh, I got into this cash game and I did this and I doubled up in, in two minutes and I left, you know. So, <laughs> which we know now that's not <laughs> the way you play the game. You got to sure. stay. When you win money off somebody and then lose it all again and then right, you walk correct. away that's that what i correct do play. So, <laughs> but we would play relentlessly i mean we had crew games all the time in mm -hmm. las vegas or new york and um we would i remember one lunch or, or dinner break uh we had at that point i think there were 90 minute dinner breaks early on because there's so many people that have to go to dinner at the world series in the main event those days 90 minute break and we had a poker table and we had cards, but we didn't have access to any chips. And oh. so uh, we did have a, as you know, there's a, a room that's with a bunch of goodies and snacks and everything. Yes. Somebody went in and found boxes and boxes of red vine licorice. Amazing. And we cut those up and those were our <laughs> chips. And so that's how sick we were. We were playing with red vine licorice as chips. I love it. Uh, and then eventually, um, the 
the boss uh, had an office in New York where we uh, voiced all the shows and they were all edited. And his conference room table became a huge glass top poker table. And so when we were done, there'd be a nightly game as well back in New York. So it was those early days that really helped out. We had some poker pros who were consulting as well during those days and they would come and, and play. And then eventually I played um in my first world series event i was staked by eric lindgren oh, wow. who staked me in a i think it was a i don't know if it's a senior event or a 1k event maybe the senior event um where i finally felt you know i, I want to play a world series event and uh -huh. i didn't know much about staking i didn't know and he said i'll, I'll give you the money 80 20 is going to be the split. I said, I don't uh, care. I just want the money. I right. 1,000, 1,500 to play a tournament. Sure. I, that's not me. But I wanted the experience. And so right. uh, I was nervous about the money. And uh, so I was trying to find Eric Lindgren leading up to the registration time. Uh -huh. and he's nowhere to be found. <laughs> but I know Eric was. Um, and so Finally, I got hold of him. He said, oh, just buy yourself in and I'll pay you back. Like, okay. Okay, we'll do this. Of course, you know, I'd bust in the first day or something like that. Now I've got to find Eric. And that for me was really weird, you know, to go up to somebody and say, I busted, give me $1,500. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's like, no problem. He's like flipped a black chick on me and said, okay, no problem. You know? So, wow. you know, uh, then I started playing some more. I, I played a few events here and there. And, and of course, I've become uh, ambassador for a, a card room here near Sacramento. Uh, played a lot there. There was a senior tour that somebody started a few years ago. So I was hooked up with um, TJ Cloutier and, and uh, Tom McAvoy and a number nice. of and Kenna Good James crew. and all. We would travel around and play uh, these events. So that, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And uh, my first real score, I guess my first score was uh, uh, not far from here. I, I live about an hour and a half or so from Lake Tahoe. Yeah. And so it was a circuit event there. Mm -hmm. And uh, 11K. 11K finished fourth. And honestly, Robbie, there is there's so much going on at those circuit events and everything. I seriously did not know I was at the final table. It was not <laughs> like we were just moving tables, moving tables. And we're at a table and we've been keeping an eye on things, you know, late at night. And it's like, is this the final table? And it's like, wow. Oh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. And, you know, I got a bad beat that took, you know, almost all my chips. I, or otherwise, I would have been the chip leader, you know, but fourth place. And, you know, I'm on the way home and calling my wife. And I said, I finished fourth, you know. And she yeah. was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I was like, you know how much I won? She's like, no. I said, thousand like, dollars oh my god <laughs> so, good stuff good experience. stuff well we are a, running a little bit short on time so I, oh my god oh, I mean, we're right. gonna have sorry. to get all right pardon right. me sorry about that go ahead Tell oh me. no Let's if you've got time i've got questions. time okay okay great okay so I'll, I'll ask this next one then um okay okay um i know you like some mixed games i know you like uh omaha eight or better that's uh kind yeah. of a big one right um i do right so I know that you're not necessarily the biggest fan of what we in poker media do, you know, gouging players based on career tournament winnings. But with that said, your career tournament earnings, courtesy of the Hendon Mob, are just under $60,000, while Norman has a little over $86,000. So my question is... got a final is, table, too. World Series final table, does yes, Norman. Correct. So come on. I believe it was stud eight. Right. Um... In an eight-game heads-up match for roles or WSOP broadcast <laughs> HX, who wins? Uh, I, don't you miss heads-up for roles? That, yes. The Micros was such a wonderful animated show. Anyway, um, <laughs> they they created two uh, characters of, of me and Norman. The Micro people did. And oh, really? We were able okay. to see a, a little short demo, 15-second <laughs> clip of, of us. And we were going to be in the show, and then everything went, you know, where they went. Anyway, uh, oh, Norman is a much better poker player. He's not a hold'em player, but he certainly understands the game. Um, and I honestly, and he plays now, he's been playing in like, like a 10 game mix with some guys online, some nice. real pros. 
uh, who I play golf with, he plays poker with. So that's, that's how good he is. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, now, Norman, Norman will kill me, uh, though. Okay. We have played a horse tournament together at MGM, but Norman's your guy. Fair enough. Okay. Um, years from now, whenever the time you mentioned you've played in other, you know, you've had the experience of playing in World Series events. When the time comes for you to hang up the mic and call it a day, do you see yourself taking an annual shot in the main event once you're no longer broadcasting it? Uh, no, not an not a not an annual probably okay. unless I I cash. Now I, it is obviously a dream of mine to play in the main event, right? And, and we're we're forbidden from playing in the main, right. main event. And, well, that's why I asked. Um, right, exactly. So uh, you know. Ty Stewart or anybody at Caesars is listening instead of a gold watch, you know, just like a gold pass and the main event every year or something like that. That would, <laughs> I would love that. Uh, I, I actually don't, uh, the bigger tournaments, I play scared poker. Okay. I, I had a really great uh, day one, one of the chip leaders at uh, the uh, Bay 101 uh, event that uh, WPT does. And um uh, I, it was amazing. And then I blew up the next day. So uh, I know how to get there. Uh, but uh, the smaller tournaments, I'm a little more comfortable in. But yeah, I would love, love, love to be in the main event. That Wouldn't that be some? That'd be pretty yeah. cool. Um, well, before we get into the questions from the Cards Chat community, I want to try and see if we could end off with maybe some crazy stories. You did mention some golf. I know you're an avid golfer. I've seen you share on Twitter numerous times. You play with Matt Savage. Um, have you got any fun or interesting or crazy gambling stories with some fellow poker people on the golf course? Oh, it happens every time. I just came back from a, a week of playing with uh, 80 people in Myrtle Beach, uh, many of them in the poker industry. And, and that has actually been a lot of fun to, to meet the people and, and spend time with the folks who I just usually get a, a glancing right. uh, meeting with in, in Vegas. But there was a time uh, where a lot of the there were a lot of poker pros here in the Sacramento area at Thunder Valley. And so we always do a little poker and golf event. Nice. We were doing a golf event that, and we were done with the tournament. They said, oh, let's do a little three man scramble over a few holes and all like that. And uh, we would we had been it's like I think it increased the first three holes were like 10 or 20 dollars a hole per person and then 30 and then 40. So it increased throughout. And that's fine. Those stakes are good for me. And I'm a decent enough golfer. I, I can usually win money from poker players on the golf course more than I can on the felt. Okay. And so they, I was going to leave and Savage, my, Matt Savage talked me into playing two more holes, <laughs> two more holes. We just have a little three man team there. And I'm playing with uh, a guy who has one eye. Oh, and my other partner had one leg. Seriously, this is serious. <laughs> he had lost his leg at his hip and oh, he's got gosh. a prosthesis, you know, but the other guy he's got one eye and one, and then there's me, right? <laughs> so we come, we go, we're going to play the 10th and 11th hole at uh, Whitney Oaks near Thunder Valley. And there's like six teams, you know, so we're all boom, tearing off playing like that. And just before we tee off, they said, oh, we're not playing for $30 a man per hole. We're paying $100 per man per hole. Uh -huh. So there's some serious money in there with 20, 25 people, right? So uh, we get it up uh, in two, and there's this long side winding downhill putt, and I drain it, and we win nice. that hole. Nice. And uh, so then we go to the next hole because we're going to play two holes. And Matt Savage hits out of bounds. There's, there's everyone hit out of bounds left, except me, the one eye guy, and the one-legged guy. <laughs> so we're on the green in three. Uh, somebody made a miracle recovery, and they're on the green uh, in three and nearly make like a 65-foot putt. Wow. I've got a 25-footer. We're all going to putt it, but I'm the first one to putt. And big winding, and I drain the putt in front of these 20 people. Wow. And it's like for $3,000. Incredible. Like nice. And they, you know, Savage then got into argument with somebody in the other team. Savage then left the golf course. He didn't even finish the hole. <laughs> he walked off the golf course. We had to tell him, 
you owe us money a little bit later on. So wow, so it's not not atypical of not a Matt. Matt never walks off. That was a unique moment. But wow, just those types of actions. Yeah, very very fun. clutch. Very nice. Okay, and and I've heard your your other crazy story about having been in Candlestick Park in San Francisco during game three of the baseball yeah. World Series True. in October, 1989. Um, yeah. And shout out, I wanna give a shout out to Julio Rodriguez of the Poker Stories podcast. Uh, that's where you can hear that story. Please be sure guys to listen to that. After it was this uh, guest number 21 for you probably, right? Then no, <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. Um, okay. We do have one final San Francisco related question for you. And I got to thank, I got to thank Mike, my buddy, Mike from our crack research team. He, de- he dug up quite a nugget here. What exactly is this story about playing airborne laser tag with a San Francisco 49er in an aer- aerobatics plane? Oh, right. Oh, that was a, uh... It was a Marchetti uh, prop jet, basically, is what it was. Um, and it, we took off out of San Jose. I was doing a lot of stories for ESPN2, and where we would just do crazy different stuff. When ESPN2 first started, hmm. uh, it, was, it was a sports night show. It was, it was ESPN2's original version of Sports Center, okay. younger, hipper camera movement oh, you remember with interviews it was sure. just crazy stuff it was when <laughs> keith overman was was uh, hosting it in a leather jacket with Susie culver and so i was the field reporter and it was they said go find crazy stories you know and so it was a lot of x game type stories before the x games right um and so we found this thing called air combat usa uh that came around every christmas in san jose and uh so yeah, you you get in. There are two different planes, and you go through a little bit of uh, ground school for about an hour, and they they talk aeronautics and, and flight patterns and what how to attack things, and you go up with a pilot, and you go because uh, we're out of San Jose. We flew west and got out over the ocean uh, because they say if you crash, you're not going to kill anybody but yourself. Sure. Very re- reassuring. And it makes sense, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, so we got in and, and then once we're up in the air, the pilot says, it's yours. And you take over wow. and you've got these lasers that can fire and trigger a big smoke bomb coming off the other plane. <laughs> and um, That's so cool. Uh, I, I passed out while I was there because the G-forces, the guy says, do this and you keep going down. And oh, he says, if you start, you might start to gray out a little bit. And then, yeah, it's like this gray pattern comes across your eyes. Wow. And I woke up, I was like drooling, you know, and the, we were still down. I wasn't out long. And I looked over and I said, didn't you take the wheel? You know, he said, no. Nah. <laughs> um, wow. And then the 49er actually threw up at some point. Um, oh, my goodness. But he beat me two out of three. Uh, but he, he was able to get me in a dog fight. Quite Incredible. an experience incredible yeah. that's that is one heck of a story so wow <laughs> all right we have reached the segment of the show where we turn to our cards chat community to see what you guys wanted to ask our guests we have a dedicated if they're friend. still listening after all of this they're Come still on. listening absolutely um and we've got uh, a dedicated thread on the cards chat forums for this so as we announce who our future guests are going to be please be sure to send in your questions our first questions come from crystals thank you very much crystals um, Lon, what is it about Norman that you connect with? His humor. Uh, it, it was the first thing that got me. I learned who Norman was uh, reading the San Jose Mercury News. He had a column in there every Friday. Uh, we had never met, uh, but the people in my household knew I was reading Norman's column on Friday because I was just laughing. Nice. and laughing and later on it became they knew who was on the phone because i was just laughing and so he is uh so smart um and just subtle uh he hates puns and over the top humor uh but if you can keep up with him uh wow he will keep you entertained so that was the original awesome very cool uh next question from crystals what other sorts of goals or bucket list items do you still want to do with your career? I would love to, uh, well, it's always been a goal of mine to work the Olympics and I, I mm-hmm. never have. 
Uh, I have traveled the world, broadcast from several different continents. Uh, but yeah, bucket list uh, originally was to cover international skiing. I did that with World Cup skiing with ESPN. Nice. Uh, the Olympics uh, would be pretty cool, I think. So yeah, the Olympics, I'll say. Okay. Or golf. I'll take golf. <laughs> or golf at the Olympics. How about that? Good answer. Uh, Freddie DR87, thank you very much for sending in this question. Uh, Juan, what is the poker variant that you enjoy commentating on the most? Uh, wow. I would say strip poker if they still did that show. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I like... Uh, you know, we, we haven't done much, really. I mean, it's, we did a lot of mixed shows, early, mixed games early on. Uh, we even did a Raz show that never appeared on ESPN, oh. appeared on the uh, DVD that they put out during the Raymer year. It was a bonus show that we wow. had done. Um, so there's, yeah, there, there's, um, I, I really like the heads up. The heads up is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different animal. I think it's the purest form of poker. And you get guys uh, like, uh, you know, the plaid shirted John Smith who come in and, and just blow everybody away. And yep. he becomes a, a hero uh, to Absolutely. even the poker players. So that that's pretty cool. So uh, I do enjoy Heads Up a lot. Awesome. Very cool. Shout out to John Smith. No, he wasn't on the podcast. Yet, no, but... good. I was hoping. <laughs> That plays yeah. one event a year and he's ahead of me. So he's... Not yet, not yet. <laughs> the, the World Series Poker Janitor is going to be on after <laughs> That's all. Um, Acid Burn FX, thank you so much. I've got a trio of questions for you here. Um, always ask very interesting questions. Lon, what irritates you the most about other people and what is your reaction to it? Are we talking poker related, I hope? Anything? Of course. Uh, well, actually with people, it would be, it's the same thing. It's, it's kind of being ignorant of what you're talking about. Mm. Um, and people tend to, uh, try to look smart in situations, um, when they're not fully prepared. So I, I, you know, and just declaring things that are, they think are true, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I do so much research for my job. Other people I, that work with me do the same. Um, and I see no reason why that can't carry over in, into real life um, and respect the person you're dealing with. Uh, again, poker as well as, as real life. Treat everyone, you know, with kindness and, and you know, it's civility and, and, you know, make it a discussion and, and not a battle. Um, but my top pet peeve in poker would be slow rolling. So <laughs> don't slow any, slow roll anybody at the table and, and, and don't do it in real life. You know, just be kind, just get through life. Why not? You know, like we're all it. in it together. Yeah. Def definitely a message that resonates with me and I'm sure everyone listening and watching. I, I know it does. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Second question from Acid Burn FX, our penultimate question here for the podcast. What are the top three characteristics that you don't have and how do you handle not having them? Characteristics. Uh, characteristics. Um, wow. I, uh, I wish I could, I, w I wish I had more stick to uh, to things. Hmm. Um, and I think I come by it honestly, where I am multi-talented, uh, but not divinely talented in anything. <laughs> you know, I can do a lot of things good. Today, I've already, you know, like I said, I've, I've shopped. I'm making rosemary ice cream. I'm building a planter box for a friend of mine, and sure. I've got stuff to do out front with my front yard. So, but I, all those things are partially done. You know, right as we speak. Um, so I wish, yeah, that I, I could just, uh, I, I wish I was supremely talented in something. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Okay. And so far it's got me, you know, this far. So I, okay. I'll, I guess I'll take what I got. <laughs> okay. We will accept that answer. Um, your last question here, um, is kind of a big one. We saved it for last for a reason. What is your mission in life from Acid Burn FX? My mission in life, um, 
you know, is, is to, wow, change, uh, not change the world, but to just try to make it a better place than I found it, I guess. Um, and uh, I have a different perspective on life. Five years ago, my, my wife died and uh, we'd been married almost 35 years. And I think I feared death uh, before that. And I maybe lived in a, in a different way. And uh, after I lost her, uh, it, it changed me. Her best friend is a psychologist. And I told her this one time, this is, I, I don't fear dying anymore. She says, are you, she's worried. Are you suicidal? I said, no, I'm not suicidal. I'm just not afraid of it. And I want to, I want to go through life, not fearing that I want to go through life saying yes. Um, so my mission is to say yes to things, to experiences and to try different things even now. Um, and, just find out who, who I am um, now. And because I'm a different person uh, than I was, you know, and so it's to, to do good, to, to see good and to, to recognize it and, and to thank people for doing good. And uh, again, just try to, you know, make sure my kids are happy. I got two kids and, and that they are, secure in, in, in what they want to do and where they want to head and give them that insight that this moment you're in now is not your whole life. Yeah. And to try to uh, find something that makes you happy. You know, maybe I could have gone into something that was more lucrative or, you know, instead of doing those cheap shows back then, but, hmm. um, you know, find value in what you're doing and do the best you can. Brilliant. That's, that's such a, a beautiful and, and touching answer. And, and you talk about saying yes. I just have to say thank you for saying yes and agreeing to do this interview, Lon. It's uh, <laughs> been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks to everyone who sent in questions for Lon. Uh, a friendly reminder to everyone in our Cards Chat community, we'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. And please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you'd like the show. If you like the show, um, Lon. Before we let you go, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? No, I, I just, uh, you know, you're you're part of the the World Series team, and and um, I just uh, want to know that you know we appreciate what you do, uh, and to keep the information flow going, even with this this podcast and and everything, and that. Um, you know, it's not just me and Norman. It, it was never just Mike and, and, and Vince and those guys because we can't do anything uh, close to what we do uh, without a whole team. And we're just part of the team. You know, we just happen to, you know, have to wear makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Lon. And I can certainly uh, c confirm it's a, a huge team effort and everyone on that team is exceptionally special. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank Lon, you. thank you again very much. Thank you all for tuning in once again to another episode of Cards Chat. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. And I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>